Good evening. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Leanne Sanders. It's been just slightly over a year since the remains of Megan Gallagher of Saskatoon were recovered from a rural area on the South Saskatchewan River. Now her family is trying to keep her name alive. An act of trauma. Debbie Gallagher uh, says Megan's case was it's, one it's... of more than a hundred cases of missing Indigenous people needing resolution in Saskatchewan. There's still 137 families in Saskatchewan missing a loved one. That's long term, over six months missing people. It's not over. Debbie and Brian Gallagher are getting ready for Megan's memorial walk on Sunday in Saskatoon, a walk they started when their daughter was still missing. Brian is hoping for the same support as other years. One of the things that's overshadowing it is the starting of the pretrials for the six of the more serious charges. So immediately following the walk on the, on the 18th, uh, Monday morning, we'll be in court for the pretrials for the first of the first degree murder pretrials. And what we're looking at in terms of that is six pretrials booked within the next couple of months. And each one of them is scheduled to last for a week. So six weeks out of the next eight weeks, we're going to be in court for, for the day. Four people charged with first degree murder in Megan's case and two charged with unlawful confinement and aggravated assault return to court next week. Three of the nine charged have pleaded guilty and have already been sentenced. Meanwhile, the RCMP and the Provincial Coroner's Office are trying to identify a body discovered four days ago southeast of North Battleford. They're asking people to call in any tips they may have. And Prince Albert City Police are asking for help on a decades-old cold case. Jean Lachance was 29 when she disappeared on September 14, 1991. Her body was found the next day in a wooded area in that city. She left behind five children who are now adults. The Mohawk mothers were back in court this week after construction resumed on the old Royal Victoria Hospital site in Montreal. Quebec's Infrastructure Society and McGill University say the search for unmarked graves in that area is done, but the mothers disagree. Emilia Fournier reports. Excavation started up again at McGill University September 11th for the new Vic project. A renovation of the old Royal Victoria Hospital led by McGill and Quebec's Infrastructure Society, or SQI. This is how non-transparent this investigation is. But the Mohawk mothers, Organistan Seda, say that it's too early for this. It's like they're trying to rush through it. So every time uh, we're doing one investigation on one place, they're trying to hurry to the next one, to the next one, to the next one. And so therefore, there was very, very little time, maybe a day or two before we knew that more drilling was going on. A dress, fragments of a shoe and animal bones were found close to where cadaver dogs detected traces of human remains near the Hersey Pavilion. GPR scans also showed several anomalies on the grounds. They have yet to manually search the area directly against the building where sniffer dogs detected remains or through the piles of dirt that were unearthed. In August, McGill and the SQI terminated the mandate of the archaeologist panel that the Ganestansara selected, leaving the two institutions in charge of the investigation. And what they're putting out to their students and what they're putting out in the press is they're minimalizing it and they're making it like, no, 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 we conducted. They didn't say whether they finished or whether they passed on the information, but it's like they are trying to rush to get through a next stage. And I don't know why. The Ganestansara were in Quebec Superior Court with McGill and SQI September 14th to address what they see as a non-respect of their settlement agreement, concluded this past spring to guide the searches on the new Vic site. This is meant to be a respectful investigation and it is being blown out of proportion in the means that they are taking every chance available to take gray areas that have not been um, fine pointed and manipulating them in a way to their advantage. 
McGill sent an email to their students indicating, quote, this stage of work has not produced any evidence of human remains or unmarked graves. In an email to APTN, McGill indicated that the archaeology company working on the site, Ethnoscope, said the dress, dating from the 1990s, and the shoe fragments, dating from the first part of the 20th century, are not significant evidence of unmarked graves. Until the judge delivers his ruling, construction will continue, and so will the Mohawk mothers search for answers. Emilia Fournier, APTN National News, Montreal. After the summer break, Parliament resumes sitting next week. Word is that the Liberals will be pushed hard for more affordable housing for Indigenous people and to search Winnipeg landfills for missing or murdered women. APTN's Fraser Needham reports. NDP MP Blake Desjardins says it's time the Trudeau government stepped up to the plate and addressed the affordable housing crisis facing Indigenous people in major cities. Indigenous people make up the largest proportion of houseless community members right now and winter's coming and that means there'll be direct proportionate amount of deaths because the government's failing to act we used to build houses in this country we're not building houses like we used to and so it's an emergency facing our country's economy but it's also an emergency facing the everyday lives of people and so we're going to need to build housing non-market housing native women's association of canada president carol mcbride agrees indigenous women are finding themselves unable to afford a roof over their head and need help our First Nations across this country are uh, uh, really suffering in terms of like, you know, we can't get loans for our housing or mortgages or, um, you know, we have to sign all, uh, like, it's such um, a disturbing process uh, for our people. For more than a year, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls advocates have been pushing for a search of the Prairie Green landfill just outside of Winnipeg, where it is believed the remains of at least two First Nations women are located. McBride says it is unconscionable that the Manitoba Progressive Conservatives have not shown any interest in searching the landfill. I can't understand how the provincial government, especially led by a woman, to take that kind of um, um, position, not to find uh, our loved ones or our sisters um, when they can. But Desjardins says the Trudeau government is not exactly blameless on the issue either. If it's a problem of resource, they should pay up and make it happen. You know, it's not rocket science to search these landfills. Landfills have been searched before. And yeah, the option of the government is to point fingers and say it's your problem or my problem. But any time that the pointing fingers games is played, it's always Indigenous people and regular folks who suffer from that. APTN News reached out to Crown Indigenous Relations Minister Gary Anasandegri, Conservative critic Gary Vidal, Assembly of First Nations Interim National Chief Joanna Bernard, and the Métis uh, National Métis Council for Council comment, Métis but Columbia. all were unavailable. We need... Fraser Needham, AP10 National News, Ottawa. Hundreds of people gathered on Parliament Hill today in Ottawa as part of a rally to fight climate change. The event included various musicians, artists, activists, and politicians, all calling on the Trudeau government to stop the reliance on fossil fuels and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. One of the speakers was Ottawa po Poet Laureate and Kittigan Zibi Anishinaabeg member Albert Dumont. He says Canada has a lot to learn from Indigenous peoples when it comes to respect for the environment. In the past, there was an honour song, sung for everything, like the grass, the sky, the trees, the birds, the animals. Everything was respected and honoured because people understood very clearly that these things had to be healthy for the people to be healthy. So uh, it's part of our culture, it's part of our identity. We have to take a short break. When we're back, we'll hear from our Truth and Politics panel on Meta's Canadian News Band. Welcome back. 
As we've been reporting here at APTN News, Ottawa's Online News Act is impacting many Indigenous news sources. Meta's blocking of news on Facebook and Instagram has also been criticized in times of crisis like the recent wildfires. For more on this, I talked to Negan Sinclair and Carrie Benjo yesterday. Thanks for joining us today. Carrie, let's get started with you as you're the editor in chief of Eagle Feather News. How has the Online News Act and Meta's blocking of news on Facebook and Instagram impacted you? It's, it's made a significant impact because with my production, we only produce 10,000 copies and it goes out throughout the province and that's a newspaper copy. And so unless you have a subscription, you don't have access. So what we have done is we've used social media to share our stories, the good news stories, and often a story that may not have even seen the light of day gets 400, 600 shares. And a lot of people get to hear these stories that normally wouldn't make make the news and now with the blocking it's become increasingly more difficult for us to to do what we do and that is to share good news across um, all platforms. Nigan, you're a columnist at the Winnipeg Free Press, the oldest active newspaper in Western Canada. Any sense of the impact there? Uh, well, I'll give you a, a little indication. Uh, we received emails uh, on voluntary layoffs, uh, invitations for people to volunteer to do that, to leave the newspaper. Uh, that's the third time that we've received that. But the pandemic on top of the meta cutting off our news uh, online being circulated uh, has really impacted the newspaper. Um, I have to disclose that we, before all of this had happened, we had a partnership with Facebook. Uh, and so we were working outside of the legislation before there was even legislation to work with social media companies to make sure that they were supporting local news. And so newspapers were finding a way. Uh, this legislation by the Liberals uh, has really provoked a war and has resulted in our paper uh, receiving uh, a radical decrease in viewership for our stories and it's hitting the bottom line. So it's threatening not just uh, Carrie's paper but also the really bigger ones or the bigger ones across Canada like us. Carrie, Eagle Feather News has a website. Wouldn't you rather people visit your website than finding your stories on social media? Ideally, yes. That would be the best way but people are plugged into social media every day they don't go and take those extra steps unfortunately we've made it um made people lazy in a way that they don't want to have to take those extra steps because we've been feeding all the content onto these social platforms and so yeah it would make it easier if they did come to our website some people do some we've seen an uptick in people subscribing to our newspaper but, you know, I just think of all those other people that don't have access, readily access, things readily available to them. They depend on people that they know to feed them um, news content. And so um, I really would like people to visit our website and stuff like that, but until they, get in the habit, it's going to take a, a, a long time before that does happen. Again, what do you see as the way out of the deadlock between the federal government and social media giants, or is this just going to be the reality going forward? Well, let's be clear. Uh, we're talking about pennies for billionaires when it comes to Meta. Uh, they could pay this. They absolutely should pay something to support local news in Canada. Uh, and the fact that they're refusing to do so or even come to the negotiating table uh, ha is the ultimate problem. It, it, it's the problem that the billionaires running the social media companies in the United States just simply don't want to pay anything at all. Uh, the federal liberals, however, aren't helping by imposing a legislation uh, and forcing Meta to pay, you know, 
without any kind of sense of a, of a collectivity. However, uh, the companies in the United States really aren't willing to come to the table and pay anything. Uh, so the only solution really, I think, was what was happening before, which was that individual news agencies were working with uh, those large social media companies to be able to support uh, both our interests and their interests to deliver local news. And the fact is that Carrie's right, local news saves people's lives. As we saw during the fires in Yellowknife, uh, people weren't turning to websites. What they were doing is turning to Facebook to connect with one another. And they need to see on those social media platforms where to go, what information is accurate, most importantly, keep them away from conspiracy theories and lies. Uh, that's how we get into problems all across, whether it be election interference or whether it be life or death situations. This is how we stop those things. All right, we'll have to leave it there for today. Thanks, guys, for joining us. You much. Elections are now underway in Alberta for leadership of the Métis Nation of Alberta. Audrey Poitra is well known in political circles, but after 27 years as president, she is retiring. Two people are hoping to replace her. Yesterday, we profiled candidate Joseph Pimlot. Today, APTN's Chris Stewart talks to Andrea Sandmeyer, the other candidate for president. Andrea Sandmeyer is the vice president of the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 2. She told APTN that her time there and her previous experience makes her the best candidate to become the new MNA president. Prior to the five years of sitting at the table as vice president, I was in the banking industry for over 15 years. So I bring a lot of financial experience to the table, as well as organizational administration and management skills. She says having control of their own children's authority is a high priority. Right now I actually sit on the Children's uh, Services Advisory Committee within the Métis Nation of Alberta where we are building a children's authority, a model of care and the law which will bring our children home. We will have our, have our own children's authority under that legislation and citizens have been asking for that for years. As a board member of the Bonneville Rehab Centre, she says she will work on improving access to treatment for those who need addiction services. And I hear all the time from citizens and uh, people that work in the, in the rehab that the wait times are just far too long. Six weeks to get into a program, not enough detox beds, not enough wraparound services after people come out of rehab, and we need to change that for our citizens. We need to make sure that they are taken care of and that they have a clear path to move forward to sobriety. Longtime president Audrey Porter has endorsed Sandmeyer. She told APTN that her endorsement um, means a lot. I have watched Audrey um, in the background. I watched her for years doing and moving our nation forward, doing the things that the citizens have asked her uh, to do. Um, she has brought, you know, so much to the nation and so much to our citizens um, with Métis self-government and Métis rights. And I'm just very proud and honoured that she would endorse me to be the pre to be the next president of the Métis Nation of Alberta and the first president under the Otipimsoak Métis government. Voting continues until September 19th at 8 p.m. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. Another short break now, but when we return, we'll take you to Yukon where a hefty art prize is up for grabs this weekend. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. Iris Flett took this photo of the northern lights illuminating the sky over Barrens River, Manitoba. Great photo, Iris. For the chance to be our next photo of the day, send your photos to share at aptn.ca. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the east coast, Nova Scotia 22 and Fredericton 17. Newfoundland and Labrador, 19 at Happy Valley Goose Bay. Quebec, Shibugamu, 21 and 18 in Quebec City. Peterborough and Toronto, 23 and Sarnia, 22. In Northern Ontario tomorrow, Big Trout Lake, 13 and Elliott Lake, 22. Northern Manitoba, Churchill, 11 tomorrow and the Paw, 19. 
Winnipeg and Gimli 16 tomorrow, Dauphin and Brandon 18. Southern Saskatchewan, North Battleford 27 tomorrow and Regina 24. Further north, Uranium City 19, Buffalo Narrows 23 and sunny tomorrow. Northern Alberta, Fort Chip 20 tomorrow, Peace River and Grand Prairie 21. In Edmonton, 25 tomorrow, Calgary 27. Southern BC, Vancouver 21, Bella Coola is 20 tomorrow. Further north, Dees Lake 11 and Prince Rupert 16. Rock River will be 13 and Dawson and Mayo 14. Northwest Territories, Norman Wells and Wrigley 17, Yellowknife 18. Further north, Colville Lake 14 and Inuvik 13. Cambridge Bay 10 and Baker Lake tomorrow is 11. In Nunavut, Iqaluit is 5 tomorrow and Pangertung 3. Despite its small population, the Yukon has one of the highest proportions of artists in the country. A prize ceremony is being held this weekend where the winner will take home $20,000. Our reporter, Sarah Connors, spoke to some of the finalists. It's hard not to notice Cole Paz's Yukon Indigenous comic books. The illustrations showcase personal stories from Paul's life as well as his tall tan heritage. You know, it's the way I communicate to the world, is through sequential images. Paul's is one of six artists shortlisted for the $20,000 Yukon Prize. The biennial award celebrates the very best in Yukon art. Shortlisted artists showcase their work at an opening reception at the Yukon Art Centre Thursday evening. That includes Elena Wachelle, an artist of Red River Métis descent. Her work utilizes seed beads to represent digital screenshots of fashion images and focuses on shopping and consumption. And for me it was <clears throat> really just investigating how the, it had, these images had an irrational power over me. Wachelle says she's not focused on the prize winnings. Instead, she's happy her work is being appreciated by new audiences. I think so far as being to be a finalist has been awesome to get this recognition and get a bit of outside exposure, which is super cool. The Yukon Prize is privately sponsored and is a partnership between the Yukon Arts Foundation, the Yukon Arts Center and volunteers. It's intended to allow the winner to focus on creating art full time. Other finalists will each receive $3,000. Paul says he's pleased to see First Nations art celebrated and promoted. Keeping our work um, contemporary and keeping it um, true to our culture at the same time, uh, you know, it's like we're showing that we can do it. We can thrive and uh, survive in colonization. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. That is all we have for you tonight. If you want to see more on these stories and much more, head over to aptnnews.ca. Have a great weekend.